<clears throat> All right. Hi, my name is Katie Fahrenbacher, senior writer and analyst covering transportation for GreenBiz. And today we're going to be talking about how software will define the future of e-mobility. Before we kick it off, I just want to do a few housekeeping things. Um, if you can see on the right hand side, we've got a chat channel for this specific session. So if you see event session and direct message session is the link that you want to be on. We invite all attendees and speakers too, if you want to uh, add your um, to introduce yourself in the in the chat channel. Tell us where you're coming from, your companies. You can even put your LinkedIn there, but also, you know, we'd love to hear your comments, your feedback, and also your questions for our speakers today. Um, and I know you're going to have a lot of questions for them. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how software will define the future of e-mobility. Um, it's the idea that the driver experience um, with an internal combustion engine vehicle, you know, will be very different than an EV. And, you know, how is software playing a key role in this uh, new EV experience from the charging perspective, from the driving perspective, from the buying perspective? We're going to go over a lot of great things um, in this session. Um, and a couple other housekeeping before before we uh, introduce our speakers. We are recording the session, so it's going to be available about in about three weeks um, after the session, but it will be recorded. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce my speakers. Um, we've got Colleen Jansen. She's the Chief Marketing Officer for ChargePoint. I think most of you probably know ChargePoint, but it's an electric vehicle charging provider. And we've got Gregor Hembro. He's the head of Polestar for the Americas. And you probably know Polestar too, but it's an automaker co-owned by Volvo Car Group and Chinese car company Geely. So I'm gonna start off by asking our great speakers, you know, so how is the EV and the internal combustion driving experience you know, different, and how are each of your companies enabling that? Gregor, why don't we start with you? For sure. Well, the, there's two questions in there. One's experience, and one's, I think, the fostering or the enabling of. Um, the, the experience is quite dramatically different. I mean, when you look at the basics of it, it still gets you from one place to another with four wheels at the end of it. But when you talk a little bit about the propulsion system, the obvious one is one's electrification, one's an internal combustion engine. But then things start to get very interesting for us, as well as I think the people that are driving it, and that it comes down to is the performance that's associated with electric vehicles. Uh, the beautiful thing about EVs is that they have torque and horsepower almost from the onset. So almost synonymous with an EV vehicle is incredible acceleration and very little lag as far as a gearbox goes. So you don't have a traditional six-speed gearbox or seven-speed gearbox. You have a very fluid, rapid acceleration and a very quick and flat torque and horsepower curve. And I think that to talk a little bit about the major differences from when I sit back with customers and from my own experience, that's one of the biggest takeaways from it is the refinement that they hear from no in very little noise, vibration and harshness, as well as obviously the quick acceleration that goes from it as well. Um, I think the other question is about the enabling of it. Uh, and I think that comes through about building software, just to hit it off really quickly, that really leverages both convenience and confidence for the customer. And I think as we go about today's discussion, there's going to be a lot of examples that I think both Colleen and myself will bring to the front about how we actually foster that and enable the customers to have a great buying experience and an ownership experience when they get into an EV car. What about you, Colleen? Perspective sure. on... Yeah, how uh, EV driving or EV fueling obviously is is different than internal combustion fueling. How is ChargePoint um, enabling that? Yep. Well, EVs are really born in an era of connectedness and um, new technologies. And that's something that we think about every day. How do you make electric mobility not just different, but how do you make it better? So when you're asking consumers to change a pattern, change something that they've known for so long, you have to demonstrate how the experience can meaningfully improve their lives. So just as Gregor was describing the convenience of driving electric, we're trying to make fueling convenient as well. So how can charging be as simple as the way we charge our phones, right? 
how do you charge your smartphone? Well, you charge it while you're doing something else. So at ChargePoint, we're really thinking about ways that we can make EV fueling integrated into people's day-to-day -day lives. You know, it, it's kind of unusual when you step back and think about how we fuel internal combustion engine vehicles. You know, we have this very, you know, fragile, flammable liquid that we have to go and make a separate stop to fuel because there are practical limitations to those liquid fuels because of their properties. And with electric mobility, you can make use of the distributed nature of electricity, which is already pervasive, and integrate charging, fueling into where people live, work, and play. So some of the technologies that we're really excited about are those that make it easier for you to adopt electric mobility as part of that day-to-day -day lifestyle. So EVs like the awesome Polestar 2 are really born in this era of smartphones and apps and mapping that's become second nature to us, personal assistance, wearables, and new payment technologies. I think especially in the era of COVID, we're all you know, tapping to pay wherever we can to just remove one more step in the process and keep ourselves safe. So all of those technologies that we think about, whether it's you know, digital wallets or smartwatches or um, apps that we know and love or integrated infotainment systems, we're looking to take advantage of all those to make fueling these EVs even easier. And you mentioned the Polestar 2. Gregor, can you actually tell us a little bit about um, Polestar 1 and 2 and, and, and where the company is in terms of um, vehicle deployment? Yeah, absolutely. Very exciting time. In North America, our Polestar 1 is our 620 horsepower Grand Touring vehicle. It's actually a hybrid to begin with. Um, we are actually delivering those to customers as we speak right now. And the exciting news is that our first full electric vehicle, the Polestar 2, starts deliveries next week. So our first customers will be getting behind the wheel and uh, taking their ownership next week. So very exciting time for us. And uh, exciting time for ChargePoint as well, right? You know, 13-year-old um, company, you guys are going public. You know, it's a it's a big year for, for ChargePoint and Polestar. Um, Colleen, I was wondering, you know, ChargePoint has been around for a while. Um, you know, where are we in the phase of EV uh, deployment? Are we are we actually moving into the mainstream at all, or are we still kind of in, in the infancy stage? I think we are starting to see the mainstreaming of EV adoption. I mean, certainly vehicles are, you know, enduring uh, devices, right? They have a long shelf life, and so it will take time for um, for the adoption to really penetrate in the overall fleet. But what we're seeing is that um, the category is growing meaningfully. If you look at the, the BNEF numbers from uh, May, the EV outlook really has adoption hitting uh, double digit rates in most of the markets in which we operate, North America and Europe. And that's coming relatively quickly. So, you know, there are some markets in Europe where EV adoption that was bumping along as a percentage of new car sales in the single digits is in the double digits this year, even in these COVID times. And we think that consumers have spoken. They have said, you know, they want the convenience, reliability, uh, and uh, climate friendliness of electric mobility. And what we're also seeing is that charging is keeping pace with the adoption of these vehicles. So what we're aiming to do, you know, charging is all we do. And as you pointed out, we've been, we've been at this for a long time. It's kind of crazy to think that ChargePoint got its start the year the iPhone was introduced. And, you know, maybe that's the old adage of an overnight success takes a long time. Um, but what we're starting to see is not just consumer behavior, uh, adopting uh, EVs at record rates, but also fleets and businesses who are deciding, just like your, your last panel, that electric mobility makes a lot of sense because it's just good business. It makes sense for total cost of ownership and, and uh, efficiency reasons as well. So charging is all we do. 
and our aim is to charge anything that moves people uh, around the planet. And that could be people, it could be packages, and we're pretty excited about um, the resilience we've seen even in this COVID time, right? We're seeing businesses adopt charging, we're seeing homeowners buy our, our home charger, we're seeing um, you know, multifamily properties, apartment complexes, and really it's not just a bi-coastal effect anymore. We're really seeing adoption happen across both North America and Europe. We're seeing this as well, Katie. We um, just to echo what Colleen has been saying is just that when we take a look at the Conquest customers that we're taking in, obviously we're new brands, so everybody's new to us, so they're all Conquest, but they're not coming from Teslas. They're not coming from Bolts. They're customers that might have been EV curious in the past and now making a determined determination that their next vehicle will be an EV vehicle. So the likes of Audi, the likes of BMW, uh, a little bit all over the place, uh, we're seeing customers coming from. But the one thing that remains unanimous is overwhelmingly they're coming from internal combustion engines. Is there a way that software um, is encouraging a shift um, for driving a traditional, uh, driving an EV from, tr tr from driving a traditional gas vehicle? Is it making, things easier or, you know, a better experience. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Colleen, let me take it first. And, and then um, I, maybe you can add in a couple of things that maybe I've overlooked or not aware of. You know, one thing about the Polestar 2 is from the first, first pencil sketch, we always knew it was going to be a connected vehicle. And it was always going to be about the words I use about convenience and confidence when it comes to software. And one of the main things that we talk about is um, ensuring that the customers from, from our, our partnership with Google and Google Maps always know the most efficient route to get from points A to B. And during that route, Colleen spoke about this a little bit before, we really, from the minute you push guide or directions, understand of what your battery range is going to be during that journey and will if you have enough to get from point A to point B. And if you don't, it'll clearly map out where the charging stations are in the midterm. If they're fast chargers, slow chargers, how many banks are left, how long it will take to get there, how long your charge will be, and then it basically elongates your trip. So whatever it might be, if it's three hours, you, you partake in a fast charger along the way, it'll be three hours and 30 minutes. So that's where I think that this adoption rate, because of this confidence, there's no longer where am I going to charge and how I'm going to charge, it comes back down to um, while ChargePoint is doing their job about creating charging stations as ubiquitous as we can, it's a lot more about the confidence of knowing there'll be a charge during the route. And moreover is the, rap the rapidity of cars that they can charge, whether it be through the technology that we're drawing that cars can actually uh, uh, receive a charge quicker. And then also what Colleen's team is doing is making sure that the obviously chargers built in their infrastructure and the speed that they come in. You know, one of the things Colleen held up an iPhone before, I, I think that every phone on the market today can actually go all day without being charged. But I think that the new thing that people look at is how quickly can they be charged as well? So one of the USPs that I think you'll find, whether it be the new iPhone or the new Android, is you, know, you could charge to 20 to 80% in 30 minutes. And someone that travels like myself, that's something that's very interesting for me. And it comes back tying down to, this is the example you made of mobile phones, obviously it's carrying back into EV car ownership. How easy it is to charge, how quickly can I charge, and will I know I can get a charge of those things that we're looking at from a software perspective. So picking up on that example of, you know, you're on a road trip and so, maybe after a few hours of driving, um, because obviously the market is going to big bevs and that's that's becoming the standard. So, you know, hundreds of miles of range, but on those occasions when you need to drive beyond your battery's range, how do you find charging that suits that particular use case, right? So you want to find fast charging so that maybe you can, you know, get out of the car and stretch your legs a little bit or walk the dog um, as needed, get a snack, you know, the ability to not just find a fast charger, but find one that's available. That's an example of what software 
does to enable that awesome experience that Gregor described. So some other examples, just taking us a little farther afield from the driver experience, but software is enabling businesses to make sure that charging can work effectively in their parking lots. So maybe you're a workplace and you want your charging experience to be available to your employees during the day, but accessible to the public in the evening. So software can control who can use those stations and when. Software can also ensure that all EVs get charged on time. So let's say, you know, your average duration, your average dwell time, it's a, it's a retail shopping center. People are there for two hours. The rate of charge can be enabled specific to the location. Um, other things that software can do, software can ensure that multiple vehicles share power when you have modular equipment that has contemplated that. So we often think that this is really about the hardware, right? What's the, what does the charging station look like and where is it and how do you find it? But having charging hardware, it's really reliable, is super important, but charging hardware that can be directed by the software is important as well. So imagine that you're a fleet and you're running many, many depots or many sites or many locations. You want to be able to manage your energy across those sites. Having smart charging, connected charging that enables you to look at all of that, potentially even integrate with your building management and look at energy across the site, both the building and the charging, is another example. Or um, you know, in some cases, there are demand charges in place for peaks of consumption of electric power. And so how can you use software to help avoid demand charges um, that might be coincident with fast charging? Software can also make sure that you can remotely diagnose and proactively be pinging the stations to make sure that everything's operational. So there are all these driver features, but there are also a lot of site host or parking lot features that make this easy for you know, businesses of all kinds to participate. And what about the customer buying and customizing experience, Gregor? Um, you know, I know, you know, it seems like we can now just customize and buy cars entirely online. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily at only attached to EVs, but it seems like it's emerged at the time that EVs have started to emerge. Can you, can you talk about that experience? Absolutely. You know, one of the things we opened up with, with what's the difference between internal combustion and EV and foster, fostering those type of ownerships. It's years ago, as I said, you, you talk about horsepower. Um, now we also talk about UX and CX when it comes down to customers, specifically those ones that are we're seeing that are coming into the EV pool. And when we talk about the customer experience, it's it's software is driven by is driving that customer experience. So as an example from Polestar, um, we'll go back to our beloved phone example. Just simply from the Polestar app, you can learn about the vehicle, you can configure the vehicle, you can order the vehicle. You can actually construct your lease or financing on the phone as well. You can consummate the purchase of the vehicle on your phone. You can arrange the delivery on your phone. And during your ownership cycle, you can actually summon uh, a pickup and delivery service in case you need anything done on the vehicle during your ownership as well. So software has many tentacles into this whole ecosystem, whether it be from charging, whether it be from the ownership experience and then you know, there's lots to talk about also, Colleen, about what are the customers doing when they're charging their cars? And that's a, a very lengthy topic that we could talk about, but something also that spends right into this discussion is about how software is a surprise and delight for a lot of our customers from a CX and a UX perspective. Um, what do you think would make the transition from gas to electric vehicles um, easier, more popular, and more attractive to consumers? I mean, software software plays a big role. I mean, what do we need to kind of accelerate this transition? I'll start. Um, you know, I've been driving electric since 2011, and there wasn't a lot of choice back then. And um, and I really do think that it all comes down to the vehicles, making them available because drivers quickly figure out 
how charging works. They find our app. They they find the stations. They figure out that they can charge at home or at work or around town and how to manage road trips. But really, it's it's the proliferation of vehicles that fit all kinds of lifestyles. And we've seen this time and again. Create vehicles that people love and they will adopt them. Cars are a very personal um, purchase. And really, I think the the um, incentive history that we have in North America in particular really shows this. When you incentivize the vehicles, when you make um, vehicles of all form factors available, um, I think you know an electric pickup truck is going to be a really big moment in the U.S. in particular. So I think it's it's starting with the vehicles and then having charging integrated into have how people live, work, and play is very fundamental to um, to making this shift. Affordability is certainly there, but all the all the feature debates are behind us, right? The mm-hmm. range is there, the performance is there, the reliability is there, the total cost of ownership is there. It's really about proliferation, wide availability, and getting to a place where all segments of the market are served. Yeah, very well put. When I look back, maybe Colleen, when you first started looking at EVs or driving EVs, for me, it was um, it was a choice of compromises in some respect, whether it was a quirky design or didn't have storage capacity and versatility because that's where the battery went or the range was very truncated and then people did have range anxiety. Today, uh, you know, the ecosystem that I'm moving into or the competitive field is, is, is that all that is behind us. Cars are no longer quirky in their design. They have the versatility. Um, I believe that hopefully that we're leading fit and finished in quality along with that as well. And of course, the software and the, the, the customer experience are things that we're going to pride ourselves on as well. So it's, it's much more about having a customer offer. And then once we get them into the vehicle, making sure we deliver on the process that there is no compromises in the car and the way the customer uses the car. Gotcha. Uh, and question from um, in the chat channel. Um, what are some untapped opportunities when it comes to software innovation in this space, whether it's, you know, EV charging, EV grid integration, you know, car apps? Um, where do you think we need we need more innovation or, or do you see emerging innovation happening around these areas? Go ahead. Colleen. Oh, OK, because oh. I was I was going to take on the I was going to take on in car and then maybe Colleen can take a little uh, discussion on this. One of the things that I'm very excited about is the Polestar 2 is the first car to have uh, embedded Google Android operating system. So for me, when I start thinking about that, the platform that we're using uh, with Google Assistant and the ability for me to put reminders into my car and to find them on my home hub or in my phone when I walk in, or an ability for me to even activate my home lights while driving up the driveway, just really makes me stay up at night sometimes and saying, this is just the beginning. How can we make, again, this platform grow to the point where I keep going back to the convenience and confidence the customer has about what could the software ecosystem look like in another two years? And, you know, one of the vehicles that we have debuted recently is the Polestar Precept. We called it the concept car. Now we call it the promise car. And that's some of the technology that we're going to be looking at, how to even grow what we know today and now move it even greater into range, convenience, and, of course, safety for the customer as well. Um, and, Colleen, you know, Obviously, our wish is uh, something I'm sure you're going to talk about is how do we integrate the charging infrastructures into a greater degree with the platforms as well? Yeah, and that's just exactly it. I think the infotainment systems and the integration you're seeing, you know, the Polestar 2 is a good example of that, right? Their their own OS as well as um, embracing Android Auto. Um, you, some of the folks in the audience may have seen the announcement um, from Google in August around charging integration from ChargePoint into Android Auto. And so I think that those uh, platforms are really in the in the very early stages, and you're going to see more and more of that. I also think personal assistants 
are and voice activated technologies are going to play a role just as consumers adopt those technologies and other aspects of their life. Um, digital wallets make payment um, very seamless and easy. I also think that um, you know the consumers who care deeply about how they're consuming energy, where their energy comes from, really want to be able to track and optimize their energy consumption, including their transportation um, costs as well as sources. And so I think that's going to be another area as well. Um, you know, at ChargePoint, we offer a home charger as well as public charging. And the drivers, um, many of them are very passionate about tracking their greenhouse gas emissions, looking at their monthly costs for charging, and just seeing that whole picture. So I think there's going to continue to be, um, you know, more of the quantified self as it comes to transportation and how that fits into a consumer's overall energy picture. Gotcha. Um, interesting question from the chat channel. You know, in the way that like uh, Nest is taking data analytics, learning its customers' behavior, and using machine learning and um, uh, you know, smart analytics to try to kind of predict what the customer is going to do. Um, how is our ChargePoint and Polestar leveraging that type of business model and kind of knowing the customer and then like predicting and and sending them kind of future future offerings or using kind of an AI and machine learning model to make it smarter? I have a recent example, and Gregor will probably have some that are much cooler because mm -hmm. after all, we're we're just charging infrastructure. But one of the things that we did on our fast charge product was we were we needed to make a really large touch screen. But touch screens can be very fragile things. Infrastructure that has to live out in the world and sustain the elements as well as impact or a golf ball hitting it or what have you, or abuse, heaven forbid. And so, you know, we test all of that capability in, in an advanced test lab where we have big thermal changer, chambers and we test things under extreme conditions. And the engineering team decided that, you know, you could actually make a touch screen that someone could use to be able to, you know, interact with a charging station that operates to the user like it's a touch screen. But what it's actually doing is doing gesture censoring. So it's looking at all the different ways. So we actually trained up some machine learning and we had this device sitting in our offices for months and months and months, having everybody with different sizes of fingers and hands, different angles coming at the screen to train up the screen to be able to operate like a touch screen. So to the user, it actually feels like it's a touch screen, but behind the scenes, it's actually something different. So that's an example from our infrastructure world. Yeah, very similar, Colleen. You know, we are working on, again, I spoke a little bit about safety and the evolution of software and how the human machine interface is going to work in the car. One thing that we will, that we've been public on you know, coming into the future is the ability to have ocular tracking uh, on the car. So it actually knows where the driver's looking at the human machine interface, the center stack. And by that, we'll actually enlarge the application that the customer goes to select. So as they actually go towards it, whether it be Spotify or whether it be a, who knows, a ChargePoint app, uh, when they look at it, it'll expand and it'll actually uh, enlarge to make it easier. So these are the things that we're going to be using artificial intelligence for to, to a degree uh, uh, moving forward. Obviously, there's some now. things that we, yeah. <laughs> I know, for, how cool is that? <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're going to wrap up very shortly. Um, but I mean, my final question is kind of on partnerships. I think um, all companies like the automakers and charging infrastructure providers are looking to accelerate the adoption of EVs. You know, like what type of partnerships I think are crucial kind of across the ecosystem to make something like this make to accelerate the adoption of EVs overall? Well, I could tell you for, for partnerships for us. When when you talk about sustainability and you talk about the hallmarks of Polestar and working in this environment, any partnerships got to make sure that they have the same uh, the same transparency, Katie. And anyone that will pick and anyone that will move forward with, we will have due diligence with to make sure that everything from blockchain to supply chain management has the same ethos as Polestar. 
So from an onset, whether it's a good commercial viable uh, a partnership or, or whatever it might be, it really is, is that their beliefs and our beliefs not only have to be the same, but have to be proven. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I would just build on that by saying, you know, I think the, the partners that we work most successfully with are those who think about electric mobility as it can't just be different. It has to be meaningfully better. And I think, you know, those who are really aiming for electric mobility to be an improvement, um, you know, not only for this experience, but the, the long lasting effects of transportation overall over time. Those are the relationships that we find really, really successful. So it takes a lot of partners, right? Government partners, automakers, utilities, um, and businesses and drivers. So lots of room for everyone to participate. All right, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Gregor and Colleen. It was a really interesting discussion and thank you for our attendees for your really interesting questions. Really, really appreciated your interactivity. Um, and I want to welcome you to another session we're going to do just shortly um, with the commissioners of the CEC and CPUC looking at transportation and a clean, equitable, smart grid, what that's going to take. So please join us there. Um, thank you so much, all of you. Thanks, Katie.